is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Welcome to this edition of Spotlight on the Word. This is a general introduction to the Bible so that people can better know and love and serve the God who gave us the Bible. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Oh, how when we look at the Bible, we should stand in awe. Psalm 119, 161, both of the Word and of the God who has given us His Word. After all, the Bible is a book from God and about God and the relationship He wants to have with you and with me. That makes this the world's most important book by far. As we continue our study of God's Word from the Old Testament, we begin a study of the five books of poetry in this particular session and we'll focus especially on the book of Job. Again, there are five books called books of poetry in the Old Testament. They are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Let me briefly tell you what each one is about. You look at the books of poetry and they deal with some of life's most profound themes. The book of Job, for example, deals with the problem of pain and suffering. You talk about uh, being where many people live. You look at the book of Psalms and the book of Psalms deals with worship and praise. It can be called the hymn book, the worship book of the Old Testament. Then you come to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs deals with wisdom and understanding. Who couldn't use more wisdom and understanding as it concerns God and His ways? Then we look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. By way of summary, this book deals with life's meaning and life's highest good. Oh, there's purpose in life. In the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And then you look at the book of Song of Solomon, the last of the five books of poetry, and it deals with love and marriage. So stop and think about those themes again. Pain and suffering, worship and praise, wisdom and understanding, meaning and the highest good, love and marriage. These are the themes dealt with in these five books of poetry. In the time we have remaining, let's look at the book of Job. What Job does is not deal with pain and suffering so much as it deals with the sovereignty of God. A key word then for the book of Job is sovereignty, God's sovereignty, that God is the king, the ruler, the supreme lawgiver that He is in charge, and that when we look at His Word and we see His greatness, His awesome nature, His goodness, and His grace and mercy, even in times of suffering and difficulty, we should bow before Him in submission, in trust, in love. You see, sometimes we won't know why suffering and pain occur in life. We may have no idea why these things occur, but we always know who and we always know what. We may not know why suffering and pain occur, but we know who we can trust, God. We know what we can do, put our confidence in Him. It seems as if the book of Job is one of the oldest books as far as time frame in the Old Testament. 
Many Bible students believe that it was written during the time of the patriarchs and perhaps that Job was a contemporary, roughly speaking, of Abraham. There are a number of reasons why people believe that this is true from within the book itself. Let me share with you several. One reason why this book may come from the time of the patriarchs like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is because Job's wealth is measured in terms of livestock and servants in Job chapter 1, a very common way of speaking of wealth during the time of the patriarchs. But secondly, it appears that Job is the family priest of his house. When you look at the first five, book, uh, first five verses of Job chapter 1, he offers sacrifices for his children lest they had sinned and that sin had not been dealt with by the matter of sacrifice. You keep looking at the book of Job and there is a conspicuous absence of reference being made to the law of Moses or to Israel as a nation. And that's quite telling. There is no reference to the law of Moses or to Israel as a nation, something that is quite common in most of the books of the Old Testament. But when you look at the book of Job, there's also some indication at the end of the book that it may well be set in the time of the patriarchs. In Job chapter 42, Job chapter 42, we see that Job lived about 140 years after the events of his trouble, after the time of his great dilemma, after the time of his suffering, and that he lived to see four generations. The number of years that Job lived on the face of the earth seems to coincide a little more with the time of patriarchy. Now, just as a final thing to think about concerning the setting or the time in which the book of Job may well have been written, uh, about 30 or so times God is spoken of with the Hebrew expression El Shaddai, the Almighty. This was very common among the patriarchs and it serves as another possible link of the book of Job to the time of the patriarchs. Now, when we look at the book of Job, I want you to appreciate some key verses of the book. Let me share with you two or three. The first one is Job chapter 13, verse 15. Job is about to be undergoing things that we'll see in this book that are beyond human comprehension as far as suffering and pain are concerned. He says in Job 13, 15, Though he slay me, yet I will serve him. What an attitude of trust and faith. Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. In Job 19 and verse 25, Job declares, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know. And in Job chapter 37 and verse 25, He regards not those who walk in their own conceit. Sometimes when trouble and difficulty arise, individuals think that they are qualified to become God's critic and that they can accuse Him. And the book of Job powerfully reminds us in a context of suffering and pain, even more important is the fact that we remember that God is the King, He is sovereign, and He ever remains worthy of our trust, our love, and obedience, even when life is not going the way we think that it should. As we look at the book of Job, let me share with you a simple three-point outline. Job and his adversary, first of all. Job and his adversary, Job chapters 1 and 2. Then, Job and his friends, Job and his friends, Job chapter 3 through Job chapter 37. And then finally, Job and his God, Job and his God, Job chapter 38 through 42. Job and his adversary, 1 and 2. Job and his friends, chapters 3 through 37. Job and his God, Job chapter 38 through 42. 
Another way of looking at this particular book would be like this. And you think you have things going bad in your life, chapter 1 and 2. And then you look in chapters 3 through 37 with friends like these. With friends like these, Job has three or four friends come to him and offer him their insights concerning his suffering and his pain and suffering and pain in general. And then you have in chapters 38 through 42, God finally speaks. God finally speaks. Often in times of suffering and pain, we wonder why God does not seem to hear. Job 38 through 42 addresses that. And Job 42, 7 through 17, an epilogue to the story of a man who had suffered so much. The epilogue is this. God blessed Job, doubly so with even more material things, a family, and that God blessed him with 140 more years on the face of the earth to see future generations come along. Well, let's go on now and look at the book of Job a little more thoroughly. Let's go to Job's dilemma. Job and his adversary, the devil. Look at Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. And let me describe their contents. In Job chapter 1, Job is described as being a blameless man. He is upright. He is a man who fears the Lord and who shuns evil. It seems to me that Job is an amazing man. <clears throat> he is an awfully good individual. And look at verses 6 through 12. Knowing what we see in these first five verses, he offers sacrifices for his family. He's rich. He is a man that has 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a great many servants. Here is a man who is well-to-do and a great man, a good man, a godly man. But 6 through 12 of chapter 1 reveals something that no one else knows. Job certainly doesn't know. His friends that we'll read about later don't know it either. But you and I get to know. There was a day when the devil came before God. And God says this. Here is God's estimation of Job in Job 1 and verse 8. There is none like him. There is none like him. And Satan says to God, the only reason that Job is such a good man, a godly man, is because you have been so very good to him. You have built a hedge. You have put a wall around him. You have made him untouchable by the bad things of this world. You've just been so great to him. If you let me have him for a while... Oh, how things would change. God says, consider my servant Job. There is none like him. Ultimately, you see, God is staking his very character, his integrity on the fact that Job will love and trust him no matter what happens in his life. Are you the type of individual that God would say this about you? that no matter what happens in their life, I know that they will love and trust me. That's the type of person that Job was. And what happens in 6 through 12 is this. Satan is allowed to tempt Job. He is allowed to do him great harm as far as pain and suffering are concerned. But God says only don't kill him. Don't kill him. Then you look at verses 13 through 19 of the book of Job, and it begins with the expression, there was a day. If you and I have ever had a bad day, and I'm sure that you have, that day still doesn't begin to compare to the day Job had. In one day, all of his livestock were destroyed or taken. In one day, Seven sons and three daughters would die. 
In one day, most of his servants would be gone. All in one day, completely wiped out. As far as material uh, possessions and as far as his children. Many of you have lost a son or daughter. Maybe you know the heartache of that. Imagine losing all of your family at once. Seven sons and three daughters. He lost all of his children at once. And notice the response of Job in the closing verses of the chapter, especially verses 20 through 22. When Job heard of all of this horrible news, he tore his garments in humility and grief. He shaved his head. He bowed down and worshiped. And it says, Naked came I into this world, and naked I shall return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, chapter 1 concludes, Job did not sin or charge God foolishly. Then we come to chapter 2. In chapter 2, there was a day, and Satan and God have a conversation. And Satan says, let me do more. Let me afflict his body. And Job is afflicted. He is given a terrible uh, disease that strikes the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Sores, painful sores. And he takes a broken piece of pottery and he scrapes them on these wounds to get some type of relief. He is in agony. He is in such grief, such pain. His wife, out of pity, I'm sure, simply says to him, Curse God and die. But Job will not do it. When you look at Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, three of Job's friends come, and for seven days they sit quietly. They sit in shock as it must have been, to look at the state of this once great man, the greatest man in all the East. They didn't say a word. Now we come to Job chapters 3 through about uh, 36 or 37. Job chapters 3 through 37. And the word to remember in this section is debate or cycles. There are Three great debates being held here. You'll have Eliphaz who speaks in Job chapter 3 through chapter 14, and he is responded to by Job. You'll have Bildad, a friend, who speaks in 15 through 21 of Job, and Job will respond to him and his thoughts about pain and suffering. And then you'll have Zophar speak. In Job chapters 22 through 26, and Job will respond to him. Now what each of these three friends do in speaking, they may be trying to help, but ultimately they are indicating that Job must have done something wrong. At times they are eloquent. At times they are brutal and seemingly uncaring about their friend. And at times they're zealous in pressing their points. Have there ever been occasions in your life when you've known pain and suffering and friends came along and their words, while intended to help, didn't really help? When you look at these last few chapters of this particular section, in chapter 27 through 31, Job will offer a final defense of himself. And then another man will come along, Elihu, Elihu, in chapters 32 through 37, who seems to be a little more gracious and a little more kind. And maybe he has more of an understanding of suffering and pain than the others. But what basically all of them are indicating is this. You must 
have done something wrong. In times of suffering, let's be careful not to be worthless physicians, not to be comforters that fail to comfort. Job 13 and verse 4. Job 16 verses 1 through 4. People who offer no comfort. They're miserable comforters and worthless physicians. That was, that's what these friends were to Job. Even though I'm sure they cared for him, they could not give pat answers to what was going on because they didn't know what you and I have come to know from Job chapter 1 verses 6 through 12 that Satan had asked to have Job to try him, to put him through the fire, as it were, in terms of suffering and pain. And God says, I will let you do it because I believe that Job will love me and trust me and hold on to me even during these times. We are privileged to know what Job and his friends could not know. We're privy to the things that took place between God and Satan. As we come to the last section, and by the way, before we leave the section of the debates and the cycles, the discussions that are going on with his friends, Job longs for a daysman, an umpire, a mediator. He longs for a redeemer. Job 9 and verse 33. Job 19 and verse 25. When we go to the New Testament... We read of Jesus, our mediator, 1 Timothy 2.5. He ever lives to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7 and verse 25. We think of Jesus, our Redeemer, the one who saves us from our sins, Matthew 1, 21 through 25. And throughout the Old Testament, there is this idea that Jesus is coming. It's shown by way of promise by way of prophecy, by way of type, where the things that are being experienced or seen through different individuals and their responsibilities or roles depict something and someone far greater, Jesus Christ, who would be revealed in the New Testament. Now, in the time that we have remaining, let's focus on Job chapters 38 through 42. God finally breaks his silence. In Job 38 through 42, what we have is deliverance. Deliverance. We have Job and his God. In Job chapters 38 and 39, God says, I want to ask you some questions. Job, I want to ask you some questions. You have some questions concerning me at this particular time, and Job's questions principally were two or three. Why does God not hear me during this time of suffering and pain? Why does He not seem to hear? Why does God seem to be punishing me is a second question that goes through His mind in the pages of this book. And third... Why does God seem to allow the wicked to prosper? After all, we're talking about a man who was blameless, upright, who feared God and who shunned evil. Remember Job chapter 1? And we're talking about a man about whom God Himself said, there is none like him. Job 1 verse 8. These are questions that have gone through Job's mind and he does ask them as he has been accused by his own friends of some type of hideous sin that must have brought the suffering and punishment and grief into his life. And God says, now I'm going to ask you some questions. Where were you, Job, when everything was created? God is the creator he spoke and it was done. Psalm 33, verses 6 through 9. Job, where were you at the time of the creation? Can you explain the creation perfectly? Even the most eminent scientist of the world today cannot tell us exactly how a great and almighty God did all that He did in the creation. It boggles the mind. It is beyond human comprehension. He that has built all things is God. 
you see the design of this world indicates very much a designer. God goes on to ask him, where were you when I created all of the animals? I have this understanding of animals. Are, where were you, Job, when I created all the animal creation? There's silence from Job. You see, as he contemplates the creation and of all of the world and of the animals themselves, he begins to see something, Job chapter 40 and 41, of the greatness and majesty of God. And while Job embraced that truth profoundly, because of pain and suffering, he had begun to lose sight of the greatness and the glory of God. And in Job chapter 40 and verses 4 and 5, Job places his hand over his mouth. I need to be quiet. I need to see the sovereignty of the King, the sovereignty of the Lord God Almighty. And I need to bow down in submission and love and obedience and service because I know the type of God that I serve. He is good. Psalm 34, verses 6 through 8. He is merciful. Lamentations 3, 22 through 25. He is a God of love. Romans 5, verses 8 and 9. Oh, what lessons for us. As we continue, in Job chapter 42, Job will say, I repent in dust and ashes. I am humbled as I see the greatness of God. In verse 7, God says to Job's friends something that each of us should consider. Job says, rather, Job 42 verse 7, has God saying, You have not spoken what is right concerning me. You have not spoken what is right concerning me. I wonder how many in the religious world have not spoken what is right concerning the Lord. I wonder how many of various religious persuasions and people throughout the world have simply not spoken what is right concerning God. I wonder how many of us who call ourselves Christians have simply not spoken what is right concerning God the Lord. If we would speak what is right concerning God, we need to speak as the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. When you look at Job chapter 42 verses 7 through 17, the material possessions of Job are doubled. He is blessed with seven more sons and three daughters. Things start to get better again. Yes, Job still had a time in his life when he knew pain and suffering. He knew a day that was a bad day like none of us ever have. James 1 and verse 12 is an excellent commentary on the book of Job. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For after he has stood the test, he shall receive the crown of life. Are you enduring so as to be blessed and to receive the crown of life?